This week we move from a review to moving forward, to looking at where the believer in Christ stands, the position that we should view ourselves as, a, a phrase that honestly is not a phrase that we would often like to refer to ourselves as, is it? Slaves. Slaves of righteousness. The word uh, slaves is the word doulos. It is a word that um, I've often told people if I were to ever get a tattoo, this would be the tattoo that I would get. Um, doulos Christu, slave of Christ. Um, the book of Leviticus talks about not getting marked, and the connection to getting marked is because the marking was connected to deities that they were marked for. I'm like, well, if I were to be marked, then it would be marked for a deity, so if I were to be marked for a deity, I would be marked for my deity, and therefore I would be marked to remind myself whose deity I would be. Of course, I'm not marked. So, the point is moot. But we are, if we are His, if we are His children, we are slaves of Christ. Romans 6, 15, and if you turn in your Bibles there, begins for us with these words. Turn in your Bibles, Romans 6 and verse 15. It says these words. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Absolutely not. Paul begins by asking a question, basically saying, does, does grace promote lawlessness? May it never be. So how does grace then promote holiness? If, if we are not under law, if we aren't demanded of a certain thing, how does grace promote holiness? What Paul doesn't start with, he doesn't begin with an exposition of the Ten Commandments. He doesn't omit every reference to obedience, and he does not promote a formula to receive a second blessing of holiness or a second work of the Holy Spirit, as some churches have suggested. Instead, what Paul does is he says, remember who you are in Christ by using an analogy. And he does that in verse 11 when he says, so you too consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to Christ Jesus. You know, one of the beautiful things about what God does in his Bible is he teaches so often to us by using illustrations and using examples and using people and using pictures. I'm really grateful for that because as much as I like abstract thought, I need to understand. How does this change me? What does this do to me? Okay, God, you're great and you're big, but how does that impact me? Okay, God, I'm a Christian and I've now been saved from my sin, but what does that mean to me? Well, this is what he says. Consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And so God teaches by using illustrations. You see, we need earthly examples. These examples help us understand spiritual truth. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews 5.11. Hebrews 5.11. I should have told you to keep your finger there in Romans because that's where we're going to camp out. Hebrews 5.11 says this. We have a great deal to say about this. And it's difficult to explain since you have become slow to understand. Now he's talking about something a little different, but he's, he's making a point here. He's like, look. He's, there are certain things that it takes some time to get a point across on. And, and to do that, he goes into examples, and he goes into explanations, and he goes into detail, and he goes into descriptions, and he goes into illustrations, and he goes into on and on and on. 
the opposite of what Jesus did with parables, right? Jesus gave parables not, as an illus- not to make a point, but actually as a confusing thing, right? He actually used it to confuse the masses, and then when he had his disciples together, explained it. But no analogy that's given is ever comprehensive. Slavery, however effective a picture of our status both before and after conversion, is just a picture of a spiritual reality. It doesn't convey the whole thing, does it? Because we're also told that we're free. If we're free and we're slaves, that for us in a human sense doesn't make sense, does it? How many of you know free slaves? It doesn't, it doesn't compute. It doesn't add up. But for the purpose of this, for the purpose of this picture, we're going to use freedom as we are a slave of one thing or another. That everybody is a slave somehow. So you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to righteousness. And so Paul is giving earthly examples. And he says, you are a slave even if you don't know it. Back to Romans chapter 6. You are a slave even if you don't know it. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Now, wait, Pastor Tom, I am pretty sure I made my own decisions this morning. I got up. I made my breakfast. I didn't have to ask anybody. I decided what clothes I was putting on. Now, some of you men may have actually asked your wife, but the rest of us, the rest of you, made your own decisions what clothes you were putting on, and some of you that was obvious when you came in because the shirt didn't match or something like that. But you made your own decisions. And when you sat down, you decided whether you were coming in. And so you made your choices, right? But Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, Do you not know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey? Either, notice it doesn't say if, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. And he's saying, you're going to be slaves of one or the other. It's a done deal. It's not a, you can be a slave of one of these two, or you can be a free agent. NFL free agency is about to come up. How many of you are fans of the NFL? Some of you, okay. So, I'm an NFL fan. I I know NFL free agency is about to come up in March. And free agents love that moment, that opportunity, because it's finally their opportunity so they can make the choice of who they're going to be with. We aren't free agents. We're a slave of one or the other, period. End of story. See, we are in bondage to what masters us. Only God is perfectly free. He's the only independent agent. He's the only free agent. There is no such thing as absolute human freedom. You see, your master is either sin or righteousness. The one who sins, we're told, is a slave to sin and its deceitfulness. Do you disagree? Well, talk to Jesus. Turn your Bibles to John 8, verse 34. Keep your finger there in Romans. John 8, verse 34. Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Let me read that again. Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 and 19 says, For uttering bombastic, empty words, they seduce, that is, false teachers, by fleshly desires and debauchery, people who have barely escaped from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption, since people are enslaved 
to whatever defeats them. Enslaved to whatever defeats them. See, the Bible talks a lot about slavery. But it talks more about what we are personally enslaved by, enslaved to. Again, the one who obeys God is, slaved, is a slave to righteousness. There is no middle ground. There is no third way. It is impossible, Jesus says, to serve both masters. You can't be a slave to sin and a slave to righteousness. Matthew 6, 24 says, No one can be a slave of two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot be slaves of God and of money. James 4, 4 says, Adulteresses, talking to believers, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? So whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. That's a really harsh statement, isn't it? Whoever wants to be the world's friend becomes God's enemy. Now here's the truth, folks. Our lives demonstrate who we really serve. Our lives demonstrate who we really serve. This is not just on Sunday, but our 24-7 life gives a clear picture of whose we are. Anyone can fake it for three hours or a one day, right? Look at 1 John. Did I put those up there? I did. 1 John 1, 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness. We are lying and are not practicing the truth. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, that is, that is the path we've chosen. We continue to walk. We continue to choose sin. We continue to be, that's the life that I'm living. Then we're not practicing the truth. Then we're lying. If my life is continually choosing sin versus continually choosing life and light guess whose servant i am pretty easy right first john 2 4 says the one who says i have come to know him without keeping his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him first john 3 9 says everyone who has been born of god does not sin because his seed remains in him he is not able to sin because he has been born of god this is how God's children and the devil's children are made evident. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God. Especially the one, especially the one who does not love his brother. You know, as a side note, and I didn't officially ask her permission, but I know ahead of time that I've got this. These kind of verses, I... Give, given to my wife about four years into three or four years into our marriage trying to show her and give her assurance of her salvation and they had the exact opposite effect they showed her that in fact she did not belong to god was not what I was looking for, <laughs> was not the hope that I had had. You know, I remember being taught very early, well before I was ever training to be a pastor, a believer struggles with their salvation. You take them to 1 John, it's to demonstrate and allow them to see through the evidence of their life the first, that their life is his, because you see, this is how you know that you're his. Let's go to 1 John, it's a great book of assurance for the believer, unless they're not. And it showed her that, in fact, she was not. You know what really did it for her? That last little part, that she was not able to love her brother. She was not able to love the church. You know how hard that is for a pastor's wife? <laughs> they can't love the church. She was able to get all the other little actions down, you know, 
do all the things the church expected, all the actions. She was miserable. But whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother. Oh, and she despised the church. She just didn't like them at all. She really didn't. I can tell you the number of conversations we had. And I would just pray for her and pray for her. And I didn't understand. Because I couldn't imagine that I didn't marry a believer. <laughs> that was impossible. <laughs> Your master is either sin or righteousness. And you can fool yourself and think it's one or the other, but it's truly one or the other. Paul says the Christian has a new master. A different master. And that's what my wife discovered that night as we looked at 1 John, and then I told her, well, you've actually led people to Jesus. And it's interesting because I began to understand what Jesus said when there would be people that would come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? Because she could have said that. Because she had led people to Jesus in his name. But then she had a new master. Romans 6, 17 and 18. Turn your Bibles back to Romans. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up there for you. Romans 6, 17 and 18. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching you were entrusted to. And having been liberated from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. So see, you've been freed from sin, but enslaved to righteousness. The believer in Jesus used to be a slave to sin. All of us, by nature, are slaves to sin from birth. Psalm 51 verse 5 tells us, Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. We were not able not to sin. Turn your Bible to Isaiah 64, verse 6. Isaiah 64, verse 6. Keeping your finger there in Romans, because we'll be back. Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of us have become like something unclean. And all of our righteous acts are like a polluted garment. All of us wither like a leaf, and all our iniquities carry us away like the wind. So at that point, what, where we are, where we were, even the good things we did were dirty. Even the good was dirty. But now, choosing to follow him, giving our lives to him, we are under the control of righteousness. We are slaves to righteousness. You see, God freed the believer from sin's tyranny. Colossians 1.13 says that God has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son that He loves. Amen. What an amazing thing, huh? <clears throat> Christian, I want to pause there just for a moment because we were talking in our Sunday school, school, Sunday school class, and I'll be honest, the sitting here is such a weird thing for me because I can't, can't move. Really want to move. God has rescued us. 
Is there ever a moment, and this is one of the things we talked about in Sunday school, is there ever a moment where we shouldn't be grateful? Where we shouldn't just have gratitude at the tip of our tongues for what we've been saved from? Transferred from, taken out of, rescued from? What an amazing thing. I think, unfortunately, too often we get used to it. We forget about what we were like where we were, how dark it was, how wicked, how sinful, how terrible. And we get used to, oh man, things are just so good that we think so good is just normal. Man, that's too bad, isn't it? And we, th- we take the cross of Christ for granted. We take the blood of his name, the blood of what he did, the, the power of what was done, how it washed us, how it changed us, and we just... It just is what it is. That's too bad, isn't it? Because it's phenomenal, right? It's amazing. I mean, there's a reason why amazing grace should be able to be sung almost every Sunday, correct? And we should be able to sing it with all that we are every Sunday. But we're human. So there's no way that we'd be able to sing it every Sunday with all that we are because we'd get used to it. Now, the truth is God freed us. He rescued us. Man, us, we can never free ourselves. Romans 8 and verse 7 and 8, turn there to with me. Romans 8, 7 and 8. Real quick. For the mindset of the flesh is hostile to God because it does not submit itself to God's law, for it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The mindset of the flesh is hostile to God. But the believer is freed, is now able not to sin. What an amazing thing, right? To all of a sudden, having not been able to not sin, you're now able to not sin. You're able to choose not to sin. That's huge. That's a big deal. Oh, come on. We can have some amens there, folks. Because now, no longer are you as a believer in Jesus, as a follower of Jesus, Jesus, no longer are you a slave to sin, but you are a slave of righteousness. And we have been transferred from one slavery to another. That is, we are now under new ownership. You ever seen businesses that say that? Now under new ownership? The hope is that's a good thing, right? Well, I can tell you, for me, that was a great thing. Now under new ownership. The best owner I could ever have. My previous owner only wanted death for me. Only wanted destruction. Only wanted sin. My new owner only wants life only wants to conform me to the image of his son, Jesus. Man, that's a, that's a pretty great owner. Oh, his methods, I may not always understand, because his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. But what an owner. And now we, I, we obey our master voluntarily and wholeheartedly. And we've been committed to a new standard of belief. A new standard of practice. In John 8, 32, and I want you to see that again in your Bible because there are certain things that we just need to be able to see in our own Bible, right? John 8, 32. Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he tells them, if you continue in my word, you are really my disciples. And then in verse 32, he says, 
you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Think about that. He's talking to people who are slaves of sin. Now here's the reality. Compared to being a slave of sin, what is being a slave of God like? It's freedom, isn't it? What is being a slave of righteousness? It's freedom. It's true freedom because I can finally choose life. I can choose to obey a living God who wants to bring me joy, who wants to bring me peace, who wants to bring me love. Sin never wanted those things for me. So then my question becomes really simple. Has this happened to you? Because the reality is, sitting in here, every single person, now here's the beautiful thing, I can answer this part, every single person is a slave. Scripture says that. I don't have to wonder. The part I don't know with 100% certainty is which slave you are. Are you a slave of righteousness? You see, some claim to want a personal relationship with God, but they disregard the doctrine, the truth of who He is. Some want forgiveness, but they don't want to be holy. They don't want to be a slave of righteousness. They just want God to forgive them and, and take them to heaven. They don't want to go to hell, so they just want to be forgiven. Some are double-minded. They want to both serve sin and righteousness. They want to have all the joys and pleasures of sin, but they don't come to church on Sunday. It's problematic, isn't it? Is this what Jesus called his people to? You see, if we are slaves of righteousness, if that's really the option, slaves of sin or slaves of righteousness, if we are slaves of righteousness, then Paul says we must live as slaves of righteousness. You see, I, I have to view myself that way. I have to see it that way, that it's not my choice. That I made the choice to follow Jesus. That I am a follower of Jesus. That he enabled me to understand that I was lost and headed to hell. That, I, that he enabled me to understand that I was a slave to sin. That I was dead in my trespasses. To use a nice King James word. And that he opened my eyes to the fact that the only way that was going to change is if I turned to the cross of Jesus and accepted his payment for all those sins that I did commit and will still commit. And if I accepted that payment, that I would choose to follow him and let him be in charge of my life, be the Lord, the master of my life. And therefore, I would be his slave, and he was now in charge. Romans 6, 19 says this, I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh, for just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to moral impurity and to the greater and greater lawlessness, so now, Christian, offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. Again, this is based on who we are in Jesus. Remember who we are. We saw that in verse 11, right? Live in light of our new position. That's what we saw. Romans chapter 6, early on there. Verse 
verse 11 had told us, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That is who we are, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 12 and 13 says, therefore don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires and do not offer any part of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, but as those who are alive from the dead, offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for, uh, for righteousness. See, God changing us doesn't rule out human activity, does it? It doesn't change that we have a part that He wants us to play. Turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Again, keeping your finger there in Romans. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. So then, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you, enabling you both to will and to act for his good purpose. You know, there are times where we have to pray, God, work in me to want to do this. I know this is what you want me to do. Give me the desire. I know this is what you want. Help me to want it. And then there are times where we know what he wants. We want it. And now we have to pray, God, help me to do it. You see, God, God is so great a God, so loving of a God, that he not only is willing to help us to will to do it, he's helping to, willing to help us to do it. What a great God. He doesn't just say, here's what you need to do. He's willing to put the desire in, and he's willing to put the ability in. That's awesome. He doesn't just save us and say, you're on your own. He saves us and then says, I'm going to help you get to where you need to go. That's a, that's a loving and merciful God. What a God we serve. But he does say we are no longer to serve our old master, sin. You see, sin wants us to continue to serve him. But let us not present our members to serve impurity, he says, Paul says. Let us no longer offer the parts of ourselves as slaves to moral impurity and lawlessness any longer. You see, if we yield to sin, we will sink further into lawlessness, won't we? Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no plans to satisfy the fleshly desires. I think this is awesome that he put it in Romans because he's talking to believers. You know what that says to me? That says the believers are capable of making plans to satisfy their own fleshly desires. Guys, it's time to be serious about things, right? How many of you believe that if Paul said to Timothy that we are in the end times, that genuinely today we are in the end times? I believe that's true. Then if we are in the end times, it's time to stop joking around about our walk with Christ. It's time to be serious. It's time to be sober-minded. It's time to take our walk seriously. It's time to take our testimony seriously. And it's time to t take our master seriously and to live as slaves of righteousness and no longer live as slaves to sin. What I love is that we're supposed to serve as willing slaves. Present who we are to God for His service. We get to Romans chapter 12, and I can't wait to get there. Part of me really just wants to be there now because I love Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. 
It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. You see, our lives have been bought at a very high price. They are His. Mark 10, 45 says, But even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. A ransom. That's a purchase price, right? It's a high purchase price. So next time we think about sinning, think about the payment. Do you do that usually? (laughs) Not usually, right? You don't usually think, oh, just put that on Jesus' bill. I'll just tap that one on the cross. Of course not. Most of the time, I wouldn't assume, if I look across here, I don't assume any of us sitting here are that callous and that cold to our own sin or to Jesus that we would ever think that way. But the reality is that means that we're not doing what we're told to do in the book of Hebrew and fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, right? 1 Corinthians 6.19 tells us that we have been bought with a price, that we are not our own, that we have been purchased. We should serve God with the same zeal that we once pursued and served sin. Think about it. I want you to picture that person you know that just sins like crazy, that they love to sin, that they're all about their sin. See, they enjoy it, right? They do what they do, and they're about it. You see, isn't that how we're supposed to be about our master? That we do what we do and we enjoy it and we're about it. We're about our God. We enjoy our master. We love our master, our God, our Jesus. And he's a better master than any sin that we had, right? But then why is it that it seems that the sinners enjoy their sin so much more than Christians enjoy their master? Guys, we should hold nothing back. Not our time, not our money, not our ambitions, not our goals, not our relationships. As we practice our righteousness, we will grow more and more in our sanctification. And here's the part I've never liked, and I keep thinking the older I get, that'll change. I just never liked it. It's the human part of me, I guess, the fleshly part. There is no quick and easy way to be made holy. In fact, I just talked to God about this again yesterday. I'm like, can we do this quick and easy? Can you get this over with fast? Is there a faster way? Did the leg-breaking thing have to really happen? By the way, for those of you who don't know, I did find out Monday both feet are broken. So that's a nice little bonus for me. Um, But God's in control. He's in charge of all things, and that's a purpose he has. And I know that. The blessing was, as I sat there in my wheelchair the other day and I was talking with, I can't remember who it was now. Somebody. And they made a comment. It was Dale. I was reminded of Simon Peter Otundo. And Simon Peter is in Uganda planting churches. And he's stuck in a wheelchair. And he's planting churches. And he's been doing that his whole life. And he's planting churches. And he's leading people to Christ. And he's causing them to grow in their faith. And he's stuck in that wheelchair, and he doesn't get out of that wheelchair. And there's no chance he's getting out of that wheelchair until Jesus gets him. I'm like, hmm, eight weeks. Yeah, I think I can do this for eight weeks. I can be patient for eight weeks. I can serve this way for eight weeks, God, whatever you want however you want. I have no reason to complain. And I'm trying really hard not to complain. Remember, because we're commanded not to, right? Without complaining and murmuring. 
So God's really challenging me on that. As we practice righteousness, we will grow more and more in our sanctification. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We all, with unveiled faces, are reflecting the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory that is from the Lord who is the Spirit. You know, I want to be made like Him. If He has to break more bones to make that happen, I guess that's fine with me. I guess. (laughs) I'd prefer a less painful way personally. Preference. He knows what's best for me. He knows what's best for you too, right? Now here's the reality, folks. Paul goes on. And he helps us understand that being a slave to righteousness is greater than being a slave to sin. And in Romans 6.20, he tells us, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free from the allegiance to righteousness. And what fruit was produced then from those things you are now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. But now since you have been liberated from sin and become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the end is eternal life. That's a good end, right? Okay, I got a couple of you with me. That's a good end, right? There you go. Apart from Christ, man lives in bondage. Sin is the master. Man is free from the domain of righteousness. You don't have to do anything good at all. But there's no lasting fruit other than death. Eternally. And death is the final outcome. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin, the earnings of sin, is death. There you go. In Christ, believers enjoy freedom from sin. God is the master. Sin is no longer in charge. Don't believe what they tell you. You know, this is one of the things that I I get so frustrated by, and I've talked to so many Christians that go to these something anonymous groups, and they they believe they're, they're that forever. It's a lie from the devil. You are not. If you were an alcoholic through Christ, you get victory over that sin. You are no longer that forever because you are a child of God. And He gives victory. You are not divined by sin. I'm sorry. I get really upset by that. Sin is not in charge of the believer's life. True freedom is the freedom to obey God. This does not, believe, does not mean that the believer never sins. The fruit from this, the fruit from being a slave to God, a slave to righteousness, is the fruit of sanctification. It is the fruit of holiness. And the final outcome from this is eternal life. What an amazing outcome. What a huge difference. So now the final questions. Have you been playing games? Do you want salvation without having to give up your sin? (laughs) See, Jesus says this is impossible. You cannot, I repeat, cannot serve two masters. Have you submitted to God, being in charge of all aspects of your life? Or are you still holding out, still saying, this is mine? What are you afraid of? What are you afraid God will do with that part of your life that you've decided you're still in charge of? See, God only wants the best thing for you, doesn't he? Do you believe that? 
that he only wants the best thing? And see, not only does he want the best thing, but he wants to bring lasting results, permanent results, not temporary. It is time for you to give it to the Master, to Jesus. Very soon we're going to have a baptism. But before we do, I want to give you an opportunity to stop playing games. I want to give you a chance to decide that you're done with this. Christian, if you've been that double-minded person, let's be done with that. If you've been the person trying to straddle that fence where you can be about what you want and about what God wants, let's be done with that. It's time to be about what he wants. He's the master, right? Right? He's the one that makes decisions. Are you ready to choose him? Always? As he enables you? Maybe you haven't even gotten that far. But you're ready to find out. Come talk to me. I want, you, I want to introduce you to my master. My Lord Jesus. Who did more for you than anyone on this earth ever will ever could to save you from an eternity that you never want to have to face. Let's pray.